Thanks very much. And I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this country and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, I, I don't think it's very radical what I'm about to say. Motherhood should be voluntary. Anyone think that's true? <laughs> and this idea that motherhood should be voluntary is one that um, has, been animating, uh, has been animating women for a long time. Uh, it's just a little bit over 100 years ago that, um, that in the United States, someone called Ethel Byrne became the first political prisoner in the United States to be force fed. She was on hunger strike in prison. Why was she in prison? She was distributing information about contraception which was at that point a crime against morality or obscenity or one of these stupid things. And that's where the abortion rights legislation in, a, in um, the Australian states, Queensland, New South Wales, it was found in the laws against morality, along there with like crimes against morality like sex work and other crimes against morality. So um, it, it, it was all, um, it was all, you know, 1880 legislation or 1850 legislation that, that was all about uh, trying to protect the morality of society. But what was it really doing? It was really corralling a section of the female population into involuntary parenthood. Um, and we've, we've obviously come a long way that finally in 2018 in Queensland, uh, abortion was removed from the criminal code. Yeah, that's <laughs> something big to, to acknowledge. Um, you know, a lot of other Western countries got there before we did, but we got there. Um, and um, in New South Wales, it took the following year. Um, in Northern Territory, it was a, about the year before. So it's, it's really been very 21st century that we've kind of, I don't know, I think you could say ended the 20th century. But anyway, yeah, we are here. Um, but but it's, only, it's only quite new legislation. Uh, and we hoped when we were campaigning for abortion to be off the criminal code, that that could lay the basis for rolling out. You know, one, the slogan that many of us in the women's, um, in the abortion rights campaign, many of us called for abortion to be legal, but also to be free and safe. Um, so we want safe abortion. We want it to be, and, and to be safe means not only it should be provided by healthcare providers who are properly trained, uh, but it needs to be provided with dignity, with respect, um, with the recognition of the autonomy of the person making the decision. And we do have a long way to go on that front, I'm afraid to say too. Um, it should, and it, the, the idea that it should be free is also not a radical thought. If someone is going to have a baby, they can go to the antenatal clinic in their local public hospital and they can get their good quality health care. And we do something we can do in Australia from, you know, especially in metropolitan areas, but even in a lot of regional centres, we do have pretty good health care. There's definitely limits to it, and the fact that um, Medicare isn't keeping, you know, there's, there's a whole lot wrong with it. I'm not saying it's perfect, but but there is still um, there is still something to be said for it. So if you can get your uh, appendectomy if you need it, if you can have your emergency cesarean if you need it, uh, what about contraception? Why is that not free like it is in France? Why is that not free like it is in the, um, you know, advanced Western European countries that go, yeah, uh, that's all right, that's healthcare. Um, and why is abortion not free? So we were hoping that we would help, you know, start the process of pushing the envelope in that direction. Uh, but what we what we are faced with today is the backlash that's embodied in the uh, religious bigotry bill, which you know we know they've got another name for it, but we see through it. We're not going to call it that. It's religious bigotry that they're trying to um, empower, and um, and there's many reasons to oppose it. But we certainly should be opposing it because of the risk. Um, of uh, the, the threat that it is to advancing our access to contraception and to abortion care and a whole lot of other things as well. Um, but I'm going to sort of focus on, on those, but just, you know, obviously there's all sorts of treatments that, um, that bigots may decide that they want to um, impose on us the, you know, their own ideas. And what I want to say is, as a, as a healthcare professional, is that, um, you know, actually people think that we, we um, swear the Hippocratic Oath, we don't, so I'm just letting you know that, we don't. Um, but we, there, is an, there is an ethical basis for the practice of medicine, and, um, and there are principles of autonomy and justice and um, beneficence and non-maleficence. Before, before everything else, you don't harm someone, and you try to do good, and you look after, you know, you, you respect their autonomy, their decision-making. So there's a lot of those principles that come into play when it's a, about um, 
uh, reproductive health, about contraception and abortion care. Um, one of the things that is acknowledged is that healthcare providers may also act on their own conscience. Um, but it's very clear in all the kind of all the guidelines, whether it's the AMA or the different um, colleges or, or global institutions, that recognise that the healthcare practitioner's right to conscience um, is not more important than the community's right to access services. Um, and, and what's wrong with this uh, religious bigotry bill is I, I think most of us would be happy for people to have the right to practice their le reg uh, religion and, and, uh, and observe their conscience, but that can't be a right to harm others uh, without consequence. It can't be a right to um, infringe on others' rights. And then certainly when it comes to healthcare, it's not a right to impede access to high quality, dignified uh, care. Um, and that's that's whether it's a abortion care, contraception, pap smears, um, vaccinations, whatever it is, you know, people have got the right to, to access that care. And the concern is that with the religious bigotry legislation, that it's, it's about elevating the practitioner's right to practice according to their conscience and doesn't at all mention or promote or, um, or safeguard the community's right to services. And in particular, um, patients' rights, um, the right to access contraception and abortion care. Now, I'm, I, I wish I could tell you something different, but the truth is that still today, those, um, those impediments by someone of, with a certain conscience um, imposing their views on others, that is going on today. So that, that is already going on today. So I, I have m seen many, many patients over the years and even since the decriminalisation, um, people who are pregnant have made a decision that they're going to seek abortion care, who, can, who talk to their GP and get all sorts of horrible treatment. Uh, and not including a prompt, timely, respectful referral to someone who can help them, even if that person can't. So one, one of the things that we've had in Australia for uh, more than a decade now is the um, abortion medication. And it's been many years now since it was um, made accessible through, uh, through the pharmaceutical benefit scheme so that any doctor who does the training can dispense it, can supply it, can prescribe it, I should say. But what we haven't seen is the but, you know, the take up by the majority of GPs of being able to prescribe uh, abortion medication. So, so there's, there's already there's a disconnect between the access that we should have now that it's legal, uh, now that it's freely available on the pharmaceutical benefit scheme, people should be able to, if they choose to have a medical termination, should be able to see their GP to get that, but are very often having to jump through many hoops to find someone who can provide it. Um, someone who's needing to have a surgical procedure um, also should be able to, you know, like if you need to get your HIV treatment um, or if you need to get your chlamydia treatment, you can go to a sexual health clinic where you can be treated, you can have the anonymity that a lot of people um, seeking abortion do wish for. Um, you can, ha in um, the sexual health clinics that are associated with um, public hospitals, you know, you can have, you can access that. Well, why don't we have a network of uh, publicly public provision of abortion and contraception care. Um, these are, there's a lot of a uh, lot of countries where it's recognised, and we should be demanding that it's recognised that um, reproductive health care is not just about being able to get um, uh, you know have our babies in our hospitals, which, which we do need, and that that has to be there. We need to not have our kids taken off us. Um, uh, so there's, there's, there's a lot of things that reproductive justice is made up of, but certainly when it comes to abortion care and when it comes to contraception, which many, many people need, there's, a, there's not an adequate recognition uh, as, uh, across the health system that uh, abortion care is health care. That means it's a basic right. It shouldn't be something we have to jump through lots of hoops to access. It shouldn't be something that's uh, so special that we can still have, even today, hospitals that say, no, sorry, we don't do that here. That we don't do that here stigma, that's got to go. Um, and what, so our, we definitely need to oppose the religious bigotry le legislation that will empower that side of the argument. But we can't leave it there. We have to link that with campaigning to make it so that uh, contraception is free and abortion is free, that they're uh, provided with dignity um, and they're provided in people's locality. I just did want to end with one little thing just because it's um, something that I think uh, not enough people know about and it's about emergency contraception. 
which most people don't know the most effective thing to do after you've had sex when you need, um, when you're trying to avoid pregnancy, is getting a copper IUD inserted. And this is wildly under-talked about in Australia and around the world. Um, you know, most people know about the emergency pill, yeah, go get it. But the, um, we should have, in our publicly funded uh, contraception care centres, um, we should have access to emergency contraception that's going to work. Uh, and so we need to break down the doors and knock on the doors and say, give us this stuff that is going to make life better because having a baby should be something that we do because we've chosen to, something that we do knowing that it's going to probably change our lives, something that we do because we're going to, we want to give, we want to nurture, we want to do those things, but it should never ever be something that happens to us just because, oh my goodness, I've got a womb and heck, um, you know, uh, oops, it, it should be something that is made possible to do. Um, so lots of support for when people are uh, having their kids, raising their families, um, and we should have every support to make it uh, so that when we want to avoid it, we can. And that's all I have to say. Thank you very much.